the most intriguing mysteries in the field of modern UFO research can be found not in the sky or in outer space, but in the Nevada desert, in a region identified on the maps only as Area 51. There, in the vicinity of the dry bed of Groom Lake, this complex reportedly operates day and night, seen by countless witnesses and photographed time and again. And if the rumors about it are true, this installation is the hiding place of one of the most amazing secret projects of this or any other century. And clearly there are secrets of some kind in this mysterious complex, because according to official government maps of the region, the entire installation simply does not exist. Why is this desert base such a secret? Is the truth about its purpose related to the continual sightings in the area of UFOs? After the Lazar story broke, the UFO watchers came here and discovered this land. They came here in four-wheel drives to, to overlook this secret base. In a recent interview, Robert Lazar claimed he was employed between 1988 and 1989 as a research specialist at a hidden base even more secret than the Groom Lake installation. When I went to work, I was flown from McCarran Airport in Las Vegas to Area 51. From Area 51, I was bused to an even more highly secure facility located about 15 miles south of Area 51 called S4. S4 is situated at the base of the Papoose Mountains by the Papoose Dry Lake Bed. The S4 installation is built into the mountain and the nine hangar doors are angled at about 60 degrees. These doors are covered with a sand textured coating to blend in with the side of the mountain and the desert floor. According to Bob Lazar, it was in this hidden base that he worked on disc-shaped flying craft that were based on technology given to mankind by beings from another planet. Not only did I read briefings and not only was I taught the theories of these technologies, but they were demonstrated for me and I know they are true and accurate. Lazar went on to claim that there are several fully working flying discs at the S-4 facility, but only one on which he personally worked because of its sleek appearance, I nicknamed it the Sport Model. The Sport Model is about 16 feet tall and 40 feet in diameter. The center level of this disc also houses the control consoles and seats, both of which were too small and too low to the floor to be functional for adult human beings. If the story Lazar tells is true, then this design is no mere fantasy, but a reality, and proof positive that Earth has been visited by intelligent beings from another planet. Could the U.S. government actually have one or more UFOs in their possession and kept such a secret from the public and the press for almost 50 years? And if the story has already been told, why is the government still taking such extraordinary measures to try and keep the base hidden? According to this research by the Salt Lake Tribune in September of 1993, Air Force Secretary Sheila Whitnow requested control over nearly 4,000 acres of publicly owned land out in the Nevada desert in the Nellis Range complex. Glenn Campbell has dedicated the last few years to breaking the wall of secrecy around Area 51 and the mysterious base at Groom Lake. Area 51 is a small block of land that is simply the best known of the secret areas of the Nellis Air Force Range complex. Behind that, we have vast areas of desert. Until the early 1980s, it was actually possible to drive up to the Groom Dry Lake Bed and look across and see the base in the distance. It was a secret base, but an open secret. In the mid-1980s, the military seized an entire mountain range, the Groom Mountain Range, to keep Soviet spies from looking down on this base. At that point, the base became non-existent. It disappeared from USGS maps, and ever since then, the, the government has refused to refer to the base in any manner or form. Whatever may be happening at Area 51, it seems certain that the high security is not to keep people from wandering into some area where they could be hurt. It is designed specifically to protect whoever or whatever is inside the complex at Groom Lake. What's going on here? I'm sorry, the road's blocked. Let's move it on, please. Isn't this public land? Uh, could you please move on? They're prepared to use whatever force necessary to keep the people as far away as possible from this area. Norio Hayakawa says he has witnessed firsthand the aggressive security measures at Area 51. In 1991, I led an investigative group from Southern California, including some journalists, uh, to this area. And uh, after we witnessed 
the what I believe was some type of a test flight or possibly a maneuvering of these uh, objects. I was leading a caravan of seven cars on this uh, dirt road. Suddenly, a black military helicopter with no insignia uh, came over and approached our cars, came in front of our, our cars, almost about uh, 10 to 15 feet above our cars. At no time were we uh, trespassing the uh, military uh, area. We were well away from the military zone and we were on public land. We had every right to be on public land, but yet we were harassed. For 40 years, it has been the location of choice uh, for testing black projects. Um, the most secret projects in the world that our, our military is looking into, that's where they go. I mean, it's, lo it's perfect for that. Uh, it's uh, ringed by mountains, it's in the middle of nowhere. It has, uh, I'm told, surface-to-air missiles in case planes fly over that aren't welcome there. Uh, it has motion detectors in, in, in the ground. It has ammonia detectors that can sense the smell of ammonia in, in human skin. It has surveillance cameras to see wh who's looking down on the base. So it, it is uh, an extremely secure location. Of course, these kinds of security measures have been taken in the past around top-secret military installations. Could it be the next generation of high-tech weaponry is currently being tested? Particle beams, high-powered lasers, or space weapons? Or could it be something else entirely? Many of us have devoted a lot of time and energy to research on what's going on at Area 51. But no question in my mind that a new type of technology is being developed. We have seen aircraft over there at Area 51 above the Groom Mountains that definitely resemble what's known as uh, flying disks or flying saucers. Hundreds of UFO watchers regularly drive out into the Nevada desert, across public land, and make their way up to the top of Whiteside Mountain or Freedom Ridge to try and catch a glimpse of what they believe to be a captured vehicle from another world. In one of our expeditions to Area 51, one of our members succeeded in taking a rather remarkable footage of what appears to be a disc-shaped object over Groom Lake itself. It didn't behave like any conventional aircraft I have ever seen. Uh, no sound whatsoever. But the remarkable thing is that in other occasions uh, we have seen uh, the zigzag maneuvering of this uh, type of uh, aircraft. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, almost a 75 degree turn and ex sudden descension and ascension. Could this really be a vehicle from another planet that fell into human hands? A consistent story that comes up from a lot of workers is that a craft was brought here around 1953 and that actual live aliens were brought here about that same time. Well, the Russians have been taking pictures of Area 51 for, for many years. Stalin had an intense interest in UFOs and one of the things he wanted to know about was Roswell. Then the conclusion they came up with was something really did crash there, that it wasn't a weather balloon and it wasn't anything of earthly origin. They didn't know exactly where it came from but they knew it wasn't ours and it wasn't theirs and this was something that uh, was of monumental importance that needed to be studied. Of course, these claims are still nothing more than hearsay and rumor without more evidence to support them. Does such proof exist? All the stories that float around this place are as much a mystery to workers as they are to us. Where exactly did these stories of captured UFOs at Area 51 originate? The folks who run Area 51 won't admit that it exists. Uh, there was a, a federal lawsuit that was just tossed out a, a few days ago in which they just wanted to know the name of the base. And, and they fought it tooth and nail and now don't have to reveal the name of it. If you work in a secret area like this, you come to work on jets from Las Vegas with the window shades down. Upon arrival at Groom Lake, you're, you're bust and, and busted with blackout, blacked out windows directly to your workplace. You see nothing more than the hangar or the few buildings that you happen to work in. Uh, that's the interesting dichotomy. The Russians can fly over it and take pictures, but we, the people who put the bills for the place, aren't supposed to know about it. In 1988, a Russian satellite took a remarkable photograph 
over Area 51. Notice the object highlighted at the end of the runway. It's positioned at the same uh, position as if uh, it were about to take off. As unusual as the object in the photograph may be, it is hardly proof of a captured alien technology. Where is the real proof of these astounding claims? Bob Lazar paints a scenario where the, the craft has an anti-gravity reactor or a gravity reactor that, that produces a wave of gravity to counteract Earth's. If you're inside this craft, it has no seat belts because to you inside the craft, it is always upright at natural gravity. If true, Robert Lazar's claim that he worked on a full-scale flying version of this craft could well be the most important news story of the century. But what about the story behind this supposedly alien technology? How did it come to be in human hands? According to Lazar, during his stay at Area 51 and S4, he was given information which, if true, would constitute undeniable evidence of intelligent life on other planets. In Lazar's video interview, he claims that while at the super-secret S4 facility, he was shown official briefing documents stating that the beings who gave us the secrets of the flying saucer came from the Zeta Reticuli system, 35 light years from Earth. The beings are three to four feet tall and weigh 25 to 50 pounds. They have grayish skin and large heads with almond-shaped wraparound eyes. These beings said that they had been visiting Earth for a long time and presented photographic evidence which they contended was over 10,000 years old. There was an exchange of hardware and information in Central Nevada until 1979, at which time there was a conflict which brought the program to an abrupt halt. Despite this supposed rift between humans and aliens, the beings from Zeta Reticuli allegedly left behind enough material for the scientists at S4 to piece together much of the technology for making a flying saucer fly. And presumably, it is that same flying saucer technology that is being routinely tested at Area 51. Is this the secret the military is so eager to protect at Area 51? Perhaps the tight security around the testing site is well warranted, because according to Lazar, this alien technology represents a force many times greater than our most powerful atomic bomb. Lazar says he witnessed the operation of the ship's power source and that it made use of the enormous energy made possible by antimatter. And according to Lazar, one matter-antimatter weapon could easily destroy all of human civilization. Lazar also claims that using this energy as a power source makes the craft impossible to detect. The disk can't be seen from any vantage point and for all practical purposes is invisible. All you could see would be the sky surrounding it. Assuming for a moment that all of this is true, what exact purpose could the military have in mind for this new technology? Norio Hayakawa says he believes these new advances will not be used for the common good of all humankind. You can rest assured that this technology, one way or the other, is going to be used for some type of military activity. This could be used for a large-scale, unprecedented type of war we have ever seen. According to Hayakawa, the secret installations at Area 51 and S4 are not the only places our government is experimenting with super advanced technology. These are photos of a secret California facility uh, conducted by Lockheed Corporation. Uh, there are several secret air bases in Southern California where they are testing uh, the parts to build some of these uh, 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 this craft uh, objects and uh, uh, the strange thing about these facilities is that uh, you don't see any aircraft on the runway no aircraft whatsoever when this facility was under construction people in near the, the area have seen rows and rows of cement trucks almost 24 hours a day for several weeks at a time uh, indicating that a large underground complex was being constructed. I was fortunate enough to interview people who constructed the underground facility at uh, Area 51. There's research laboratories and things like that under the desert floor and then the, the surface was restored to look like it did before. According to Hayakawa, the security around this facility is as strict as that surrounding Area 51, and the sheer size of both facilities is truly staggering. 
even if some secret project of gigantic proportions really is going underground in California and Nevada, does that mean the technology is being developed for hostile purposes? To be honest with you, I would not be surprised that some abductees are taken to some U.S. underground facilities. And if that is indeed the case, there again, we're dealing with a criminal case here that involves total violation of our constitutional system. Can these stories actually be true? Have UFO abductees been brought by force to Area 51? Is there any evidence to support these frightening claims? In Robert Lazar's video, he claims that the S-4 facility near Area 51 is hidden inside a mountain in southern Nevada with nine giant hangar doors textured to blend in with the surroundings. Incredibly, this matches the description given by some people who claim to have been kidnapped by the occupants of a UFO and then taken to a mysterious underground facility. Abductees have been taken to places that they have assumed were underground facilities. Abductees have also reported that they have seen what appeared to be U.S. military people involved in their abduction. And yet, there are also those who believe that the military is developing this technology for the protection of the human race from an alien invasion. I don't think the government or the military believes that we face a major threat from anybody on this planet. That our greatest threat literally comes from someplace out of this world. Others believe the government is only interested in protecting itself. They started infiltrating UFO organizations. They spied on UFO researchers. They put out false information to muddy the waters. Uh, they actively encouraged this laughter curtain, uh, a policy of ridicule that anyone who sees a UFO is crazy. Well, anyone who sees a UFO is not crazy. Uh, that's just the, the prism through which we view this now. The government's done a very good job of, of uh, disinformation, of, of clouding the whole issue. It's an underground military presence that is vast. Friends of mine who've been in it have said that it's literally a 40-story building buried underground. For whatever reason, the military continues its effort to gain control over the only two visual access areas to Groom Lake. The public demand for an explanation to the mystery of Area 51 is growing every day. If UFOs are real, the government has perhaps a legitimate interest in, in avoiding panic and, and making sure that society does not overreact to this situation. Uh, uh, purportedly, UFOs have been known to the government since the 40s and 50s. During that time, there was a lot of hysteria about communism, about world affairs. Uh, if you were to introduce UFOs at that time, perhaps there would be mass hysteria. Perhaps there would be a shaking of the foundations of our society. So much of what has been said about Area 51 and secret installations is, after all, little more than hearsay. Is there any real proof? Any indisputable evidence that alien technology is being tested and used at Area 51? Could it be that locked deep beneath the desert floor, there is an alien spacecraft? Is it possible that behind the tightest ring of security in our history, there actually exists proof positive of life on other worlds? And if that proof is there, it brings up another even more profound question. Would the world be better off if that startling disclosure were reserved for some future chapter of UFO Diaries? The pyramids of Egypt have been the objects of mystery and controversy for thousands of years. Scholars ancient and modern have argued over how they were built, why they were built, and who built them. The traditional view is that the pyramids were built by Egyptians of the 4th dynasty, around 2500 BC, as burial tombs for the pharaohs of that period. But is that view sustainable in light of what we know today? Many experts insist the ancient Egyptians could not have built these marvelous structures, and if they didn't, shouldn't we learn who built them and why? Archaeologists have told us for decades now that many of the Egyptians of 4,000 years ago worshipped the sun and believed in fantastic beings who came down from the sky to bring knowledge and wisdom to mankind. Is this a clue to the real origin of the pyramids? Do recent discoveries on other planets tell us more about the pyramids of Egypt? Is it possible that these structures were constructed by the same architects? 
Could the true nature of the pyramids hold the answer to the mysteries of mankind's existence on Earth? All of these questions are mere speculation without more evidence that the pyramids are anything more than what they appear to be. Three gigantic piles of carved stones on the edge of the desert at Giza. The largest has been attributed to the pharaoh Cheops, but it is more widely known as simply the Great Pyramid. Many scientists agree that physically, mathematically, and scientifically, the Great Pyramid of Khufu could not have been built. And yet, there it is. 42 stories high, covering an area the size of 10 football fields, an almost solid mass of intricately fitted stone blocks, each weighing two and a half to 10 tons. Enough stone to build 35 Empire State Buildings with several tons left over. Its alignment to True North is almost perfect, and the precision of its construction has never been duplicated. But could the Egyptians of over 4,000 years ago have built such a magnificent structure? Or should we look for a more advanced civilization behind the pyramids? The Greek historian Herodotus established the traditional view when he visited Egypt in the 5th century BC and wrote that Egyptian crews of 100,000 men replaced every three months, built the Great Pyramid in 20 years. But is that possible? To build the Great Pyramid in 20 years, as some archaeologists claim, would have meant setting one of those huge stones every three and a half minutes, 24 hours a day. That would require a technology we don't have today. But getting the stones in place was only part of the problem. How did they manage to get these massive stones from the quarries to the building site? There is a widespread general belief, which Hollywood has helped to promote, that hundreds of thousands of slaves were used to build the pyramids. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Egyptians of the Fourth Dynasty were neither a formidable military nation nor a very aggressive one. But even if they were, there were not enough potential slaves within a 5,000 mile radius to have supplied the workforce needed. But if there was not enough manpower available, how could the work have been done? Even if the builders used some kind of clever machinery to help them get the great blocks into place, Egyptologists still disagree on what kind of device that could have been. The generally accepted academic viewpoints are divided equally between the rollers and the rampers. These two theories are being taught in the schools right now as facts when they're not even substantial theories. With the ramper school of Egyptology, we are asked to believe that a mile-long ramp was built rising in slope as the pyramid increased in height. Actually, it would have required more effort to build the ramp than to build the pyramid itself. There would have been some six billion pounds of construction garbage to get rid of afterward. If the ramp theory is discredited, the remaining explanation is that the blocks were rolled on logs. But does that theory survive close scrutiny? Moving a given stone in this manner can be demonstrated, but some rather obvious consideration should have dispelled this notion long ago. The only trees available in ancient Egypt were date palms, and as a food source, it's unlikely they would have been cut down. Importing logs would have required more shipping than Egypt has ever possessed in its entire history, just to transport the 25 million trees needed. Next, it's virtually impossible to roll a log on stone ship roads, but even if they could be rolled, the great weight of the stones would have crushed the logs to pulp within a very short distance. However the Great Pyramid was built, one thing seems certain. Tremendous power of some sort had to be employed. Since the ancient Egyptians, so far as we know, were dependent solely on muscle power, and that seems insufficient to the purpose, what was the force that put all those gigantic stone blocks so carefully into place? And keep our minds open to perhaps at some point learning that this is a very real possibility that other civilizations, other beings, maybe perhaps from other planets, solar systems, or galaxies, assisted the Egyptians in the construction of the pyramids. Supposing that some traveling race from another world did in fact build the pyramids, did they leave any clues as to the purpose of these structures? Some experts say the answer lies in the foundation and orientation of the Great Pyramid. It's doubtful that ancient Egyptians had any knowledge of modern geology, and without this science, it's inconceivable that a structure this size could be built which would not crumble from lack of a proper foundation. Normally, it would just sink slowly into the ground. In modern construction, engineers find a settling rate of six inches in 100 years acceptable for office buildings. In 5,000 years, the Great Pyramid, weighing 14 billion pounds, has settled less than one half inch. This engineering marvel does suggest that whoever built the pyramids 
not only intended for the structures to remain as they were for millennia, but knew how to achieve that goal. And as engineers now tell us, they also knew how to keep the four sides of that giant edifice in almost perfect alignment. In modern construction, if the builders could maintain each side of the 756 foot wall within six inches of being perfectly straight, then it would be a tremendous accomplishment. But the Great Pyramid is only off of straight alignment by approximately one quarter of an inch. <laughs> That's totally impossible to duplicate in today's modern construction field. We know that whoever constructed the Great Pyramid of Giza built it so that it would last a long, long time. Archaeologists tell us that the structure was originally covered with a protective stone coating, making the sides perfectly flat and smooth. That outer surface was broken apart and used as building materials during the construction of the city of Cairo, but the pyramids themselves still remain unharmed. And we've already heard how the pyramid is unique among all buildings on Earth in its refusal to settle into the ground, as other giant monuments inevitably must. Apparently, whoever built the pyramid wanted it to be left exactly as it was. But why? What was its purpose? And was its preservation important because they planned to use it again someday? In the early 1950s, translation was begun on a vast library of cuneiform tablets that had been discovered many years earlier in the ruins of the Library of Nineveh, the oldest written record known to science. One passage of the text seems to describe the pyramids of Egypt. Sumerian texts are believed to be over 10,000 years old, 6,000 years older than the Egyptians who were supposed to have built the pyramids. But if the Sumerian translation is accurate, the pyramids were already there before the first pharaoh was born. If all of this is true, then these ancient tablets may hold the answer to the true purpose of the pyramids. Dr. Zechariah Sitchin has spent years studying the mysteries of these Sumerian writings. Based on evidence provided by Sumerian texts, it appears that the Giza pyramids were built as beacons by extraterrestrials as part of a landing corridor ending at a spaceport in the Sinai Desert. An intriguing and exotic theory. But how could the pyramids be of use to travelers from another world? After all, as large as they are, they're not visible from outer space. Uh, some people suggested there is a vortex of energy uh, coming out of the great apex of the pyramid and, and that it actually expands in uh, diameter as you go higher above the pyramid. But for this theory to be credible, the pyramids would have to radiate energy, which an ordinary pile of stone simply does not do. But are the pyramids different in this way? The pyramids are essentially crystalline in structure, and therefore highly receptive to radio-like energy waves or even cosmic microwaves. The Great Pyramid at Giza, with its five granite slabs above the king's chamber, are what the ancient Egyptians called spirit stones. And they could have been a massive receiver transmitter tuned to some distant part of the universe of which we are still ignorant. There's a vortex of energy emanating from the apex of the pyramid, which actually expands in diameter as it rises higher and higher into the heavens. A simple example of this emanating apex energy was first demonstrated by British inventor Sir W. Siemens. When he drank from the wine bottle he brought along, he experienced a slight shock as the bottle touched his lips. The electrical activity intrigued him so much that he took a wet newspaper, wrapped it around the bottle, converting it into a crude electrical accumulator, which most high school science students would recognize as a Leyden jar. Although we don't know why or how, the Great Pyramid seems to be an accumulator of energies. The only person of record, of authority, who still stands behind the assertion that there was radioactive sand was Dr. Ibram Nawawi, who gave in 1987 a discussion at an archaeological conference in Tennessee where a friend of mine, another archaeologist, literally heard him say with his own lips that they had found highly radioactive sand in the Great Pyramid. This does not compute as a low-tech structure, but something much, much more intriguing. So might not the pyramids have been exactly what the ancient Sumerian texts seem to claim? A sort of cosmic lighthouse for passing space travelers. As incredible as this may sound, it does seem to be the first explanation of the Great Pyramids that truly covers all the facts of its amazing construction, placement, and design. 
But is there any other evidence that the builders of these remarkable edifices were from outer space? These same Sumerian texts also refer to the Earth as the seventh planet, as if being counted from the outside of our solar system in toward the sun. Since Neptune and Pluto were only discovered in this century, how could the Sumerians of 10,000 years ago have known that the Earth is indeed the seventh planet? According to Dr. Sitchin, no one but space travelers coming to Earth past Pluto, Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars could have considered Earth the seventh planet. Our quest for the truth about the Great Pyramid at Giza has now taken us into outer space and to the theory that beings from another world may have actually built this colossal monument for their own purposes. And now we begin to make our own voyages to other planets, exploring the vast reaches of our own solar system. But have our meager explorations to date helped us to find the answer to the pyramid mystery, or simply raised more questions? The fundamental mathematical relationships communicated by the structures at Sidonia are now eerily replicated in the Giza complex here on Earth, including the very placement of the Sphinx. Even the key latitude of Giza, north of the equator, is now directly linked to the DNM pyramid latitude at Sidonia on Mars. So we can't tell who the builders were. There is a clue, however, and it's in this mile-long, 1,500-foot-high humanoid face. Our thinking now, our team's thinking, is that that face is our face, or what we once were. So in a sense, someday, not now, but someday, we may discover that we, in fact, were the Martians. Are the so-called pyramids of Mars merely bizarre natural formations, or are they the ruins of carefully constructed monuments that have been abandoned for many thousands of years? It does stand to reason that voyagers traveling across our entire solar system might place such markers or beacons on more than one world. Even so, the notion of extraterrestrial visitors constructing the pyramids of Egypt may seem to many to be simply too outrageous. Is it not possible, after all, that the ancient Egyptians were simply far more advanced than we'd previously believed? Don't the theories of alien pyramid builders ignore the ancient Egyptians and any contribution they might have made in the creation of the Great Pyramid? Certainly. But then, the Egyptians themselves seem to have ignored it also. The Great Pyramid was the greatest single undertaking in the whole history of mankind. And yet there is not one picture or drawing not one artifact, not one inventory or tally sheet to tell of its construction. The Egyptians left us some 3,000 years of written and pictorial history covering virtually everything that happened in their culture, from babies being born to plowing and harvesting, building, weaving, sacrificing, praying, embalming, but nothing about the pyramids of Giza. Why? When you enter the Great Pyramid, it's devoid of these hieroglyphs. And the answer is, is simple and explained by the fact that the Great Pyramid was not built by Egyptians. The Great Pyramid was built by a group of people which are known as Hyksos, or shepherd kings, rulers of foreign countries that came into Egypt and constructed the Great Pyramid with better methodology. In light of all the new findings, experts seem to be reaching the same conclusion. Could it be that the proof of extraterrestrial visitation to Earth has for centuries been right there before our very eyes? Do Egyptian records fail to mention the construction of the pyramids because they were already there when the Nile Valley culture began to flourish? Is this the final proof that the pyramids are the keepers of a mystery that we may never solve? Until that time, the pyramids continue to stand silent and mysterious refusing to allow their secrets to become a completed chapter of the UFO Diaries. In recent years, many people have come to dismiss the so-called mystery of the Bermuda Triangle in the same way they would a superstition or a fairy tale. But given the growing body of evidence that many things are happening there that are beyond our understanding, there seems to be a pressing need to examine the legends and the facts 
about the Bermuda Triangle. To many, the Bermuda Triangle is nothing more than the nickname given to an area of the Mid-Atlantic, roughly cornered by Florida, Puerto Rico, and the island of Bermuda. But is it anything more? Is it in some way different from any other part of our planet's oceans? According to many who study the mysteries of the Bermuda Triangle, since 1945 alone, there have been over a thousand vanishings of everything from huge naval vessels to private boats, from small planes to commercial airliners. But of course, not only the craft disappear forever, but all the people on board them as well. I think the most spectacular mystery about the Devil's Triangle uh, is probably one of the ones that's more played down than any other. And that's the disappearance of the Navy ship USS Cyclops. This was a 500 foot, 19,000 ton coaling ship. And this took place during World War I. Back then they had coal ships instead of tankers because most of the ships operated on coal. Well, this ship had over 300 officers and men on it, put to sea from Barbados in the British West Indies, bound for Norfolk, Virginia. It was never seen again. The ship and the 300 officers and men disappeared without a trace. Some claim that violent weather in the region is responsible, that sudden squalls have downed aircraft and sailing ships alike, sending them in moments to the bottom of the sea. Others, however, suggest a far more sinister force is at work. Over the years, I have checked and rechecked almost every theory as to why so many ships, aircraft, have vanished in the Bermuda Triangle without a trace. From the old Spanish Admiralty records that Columbus wrote, we learned that he was the first to record the strange and frightening images in the night sky over what we now call the Sargasso Sea. We can only guess at the nameless dread that must have filled the hearts of the intrepid seamen lost in a strange and frightening world. But from his log and reports, we know that the Columbus expedition encountered the same mysterious phenomenon in the Bermuda Triangle that continues to haunt us, even in the pre-dawn of the 21st century. Columbus also recorded that the island natives, like the Caribs and the Irawaks of Puerto Rico, were long familiar with strange occurrences in this part of the world. Their legends contain many stories of sky gods and green fireboats that could fly in the sky or under the water. One of the most famous lost aircraft cases is that of Flight 19, five aircraft that vanished together shortly after World War II. It is also the story that many believe gives us the first clue linking the Bermuda Triangle to UFOs. It began routinely enough on December 5th, 1945. An advanced training flight was scheduled for takeoff at 1400 hours. Five pilots and 10 crew members were scheduled to go up. Ironically, their course was to be a simple triangle with an expected flight time of two hours. The flight leader was Lieutenant Charles Taylor, an experienced combat pilot with over 2,500 hours of flying time. Flight 19 had completed the first leg of the flight plan and turned north. Suddenly, all of the aircraft began experiencing problems with their instruments. This is Foxtail 2A, calling Foxtail 36. My instruments have gone crazy. My instruments are malfunctioning too. Where are we? Some 40 miles away, Lieutenant Robert Cox, a training Space instructor, Fox, picked up their transmissions, but for some reason they couldn't hear him. Cox called the base station in Fort Lauderdale, which had lost contact with Flight 19, and immediately emergency procedures went into effect. Base operations continued to receive Lieutenant Cox's transmissions, which told them Flight 19 was lost and disoriented, but they could not get through to Taylor or any of his pilots. Ham radio operators up and down the coast were also tuned into the lost flight and monitored their frequency. Then, as night fell, one of them caught the last words to ever be heard from Flight 19. Don't come after us! They look like... What could Lieutenant Taylor have seen that caused him to insist that no one try to rescue Flight 19? Meanwhile, according to Berlitz, a huge search and rescue mission had already been launched. But then the first plane to respond to the emergency, a giant Martin Mariner with a crew of 13, disappeared from radar. In the end, Flight 19 and the Martin Mariner, 28 men in all, disappeared without a trace, as if they had passed through some window into another dimension. 
According to Berlitz, the Naval Board of Inquiry attributed the disappearances to malfunctioning navigational equipment that caused the planes to run out of fuel far out at sea. But is it really possible for this to happen to all six planes simultaneously? Berlitz goes on to say that one member of the Board of Inquiry was quoted as saying Flight 19 had vanished as completely as if it had flown to Mars. Could that remark, in fact, be very close to the truth? Few people would deny that many strange and unexplainable events have transpired in the Bermuda Triangle. But is there evidence to support the stories of UFO activity? UFO activity different from that observed in any other part of the world. Sightings of UFOs are quite common in the Bermuda Triangle, as well as reports of persons kidnapped by alien beings. There have also been numerous accounts about disc-shaped UFOs under the water in the same way as they perform in the air. Richard Weiner, author of The Devil's Triangle, relates a case that seems to corroborate these reports of underwater UFO sightings. He tells of a charter boat operator named John Carpenter and of his remarkable experience in the Bermuda Triangle. Carpenter apparently saw two UFOs exploring the water with some sort of projecting energy beam. Carpenter then saw exactly what so many others had reported seeing. Carpenter's experience would seem to confirm that whatever is going on in the Bermuda Triangle goes through the water or through the air with equal ease. It isn't just beams of light or beams of energy that punctuate the puzzle of the Bermuda Triangle. There is also some sort of fog or mist, and it seems to have a variety of peculiar effects on ships and planes. Einstein said the Bermuda Triangle could be a cosmic doorway leading to a different time and space continuum. Do UFOs have the key to that door? We're dealing with something which is interdimensional. We're probably dealing with something which is, has been around for a very long time, not just since 1947. The UFO phenomenon is something highly complex and uh, is composed of many, many different aspects. Well, you have to ask the question, are they from another planet? We, we don't know the answer to that. A lot of people believe they're extraterrestrial. A lot of other people believe that they are uh, from other dimensions, parallel universes, time travelers, that they're us at two million years in the future, maybe separated from our reality by some thin psychic membrane. UFOs have often been seen in the area by many witnesses, and a beam of intense energy has figured prominently. But other witnesses tell of a greenish glow or mist Charles Berlitz has recorded for us the case of Chuck Wakeley, who was piloting for Sunline Aviation in Miami. Wakeley had completed a charter run to NASA and was headed back to Miami. According to him, the sky was perfectly clear. Suddenly, he was surrounded by an intense greenish light, so powerful, in fact, that he could no longer see outside of the plane. Wakeley said his instruments then began to malfunction badly. Soon, there was little he could do but release the controls and let the plane fly itself. Then, according to Wakeley, the glow just as suddenly faded and everything returned to normal. So if disappearances in the Bermuda Triangle are part of the UFO abduction phenomenon, have there ever been missing time episodes there? Take, for example, the case of National Airlines Flight 401. The Miami Tower was called for a time check. The instrument panel clock was right on. They were 20 minutes out and right on schedule. Later, the co-pilot would remember seeing a strange green mist that enveloped the aircraft, but otherwise everything was completely normal. But in the Miami Tower, the air traffic controller was jolted when the blip of the approaching Flight 727 suddenly vanished from the radar screen. I've just lost Flight 727. The controller immediately went into emergency priority status. Within minutes, the Coast Guard Search and Rescue Squadron was in action, and the Miami airport prepared for the worst. What time is it? I think my watch is broken. When the flight attendant checked for any last-minute instructions, she couldn't believe she had completed her usual 10 to 12-minute cabin duties in less than three minutes. 
and the co-pilot was surprised to discover the greenish mist that enveloped the aircraft since the time check was gone. Not only from about the aircraft, but from the sky itself. Precisely 10 minutes from the time Flight 727 had vanished from the radar screen, it just as suddenly and mysteriously reappeared. The complex equipment was in perfect working order, as the ongoing computer and manual scans verified. Flight 727 landed without incident, with the crew understandably curious about the emergency equipment along the runway. And they were all incredulous when told that their arrival was 10 minutes late, despite the fact that the instrument panel clock synchronized exactly with the earlier tower time check. It was now, along with every one of the crew's watches, 10 minutes slow. And what of that green fog? Could it somehow identify the doorway into another time? Captain Don Henry tells us of his terrifying encounter. We were coming back from Puerto Rico on the good news, with a tow of 2,500 ton on a thousand feet of four-inch hawser. Beautiful weather. You wouldn't want for a nicer day anywhere. I was enjoying some downtime in my cabin when the electric started acting up. We checked the whole system. Generators, breakers, shunts, just fine. Nothing wrong below. But topside, there weren't anything right. There was a funny looking fog, I guess you'd call it, kind of oozing all over the barge. I figured I'd better take another good look inside. And that's just about when that blow smacked into us. Twenty-five years at sea, I never saw the likes of that squall. It come out of nowhere. All our instruments were going crazy. Compass, radio, radar, engine monitors, absolutely berserk. At first, we was just worried about losing the tow. But then we started getting worried about our own skins. We were redlined at 850. Big twin 2,000 horse EMV diesels churning up green water, and we couldn't make a foot of headway. Something had a hold of us and wouldn't let go. Then, just like that, the squall was over. We set the automatic pilot to go check damage, and we haven't lost no rigging or deck gear. But then what I saw gave me goosebumps all over. A half ton of hawsers stiff stretched after the fantail, and not a thing connected to the bitter end. When we got her hauled in, you could see there was no eye splice, and the line wasn't raggedy like it had parted. No, sir. Looked like it had been whacked off with a fire axe and there was a bone aching chill in the air. Yet the rails and fittings were hot enough to give you a smart burn. We had a narrow escape from whatever took hold of us out there. A half ton of tow rope stretched out to nothing, and the barge was simply gone. Could aliens actually be controlling events in this part of the world? In seeking an explanation for the mysteries of the Bermuda Triangle, Evidence presents itself that seems to indicate that real culprits are invaders from another world. But is this the only possible explanation? The blue holes in the ocean apparently have the quality of swallowing things that fall into them more quickly than other parts of the sea. It is a curious fact that no debris has been found from the ship's or planes which have disappeared in the triangle. It has even been suggested that for some reason it has been important to take ships and planes intact to somewhere else. About once a year, some salvage crew will claim they found one of the missing TBM Avenger torpedo bombers. The most recent one took place right off Fort Lauderdale a few years back. They said they found three or four planes together on the bottom, and that sounded really like they had found the missing Flight 19. But doing a little research, I found out that after the war, they had a lot of planes or TBMs at the Fort Lauderdale Naval Air Station that they had cannibalized parts off of for other planes, and they couldn't fly those planes out, so to get rid of them, and they were surplus and of no use to the Navy anymore, they loaded them on barges at Port Everglades, took them out to sea, and shoved them overboard. And uh, my theory is that's what the three or four planes they found off Fort Lauderdale were. Are entire ships and planes being captured by vessels from another planet? And if so, 
Why would this happen in only one part of the world? The strange goings on in the Devil's Triangle uh, are not exclusive to the Devil's Triangle. There's also an area off of the east coast of Japan called the Devil's Sea. If you went in the center of the Devil's Triangle and you bored a hole through the center of the Earth, you would come out in the center of the Devil's Sea. And the Devil's Sea and the Devil's Triangle are the only two places on Earth where the compass points to the true north, not the magnetic north. Could this really be the solution to the centuries-old mystery of the Bermuda Triangle? And if so, does it indicate the final fate of those who've disappeared there? It's a little bit unsettling that we don't know this yet. Uh, we should know it by now, but this is such a clandestine phenomenon that we have been unable to, to come to a, a firm agreement about what the concluding aspects of this abduction phenomenon is. However, we are on the verge of that. Uh, we have, we're right now in information overload. Right now we know tremendous amounts about this subject and we are closing in on the ultimate purposes. And I think within the next few years, we are going to completely solve this phenomenon and we are going to know what the entire UFO phenomenon is all about. Thousands of people are missing without any explanation. That is, no earthly one. Perhaps we will someday know if alien visitors are indeed the culprits behind the disappearances and the missing time episodes in this most remarkable corner of our world's oceans. But until then, the terrifying phenomenon of the Bermuda Triangle remains another unexplained mystery in the pages of UFO Diaries. The planet Mars is next to our own. The fourth world counting out from the sun. Barren, perpetually cold, and with a thin atmosphere of poisonous gas. Surely no intelligent life could survive there. The surface of Mars, we now know, is covered with meteor craters, gigantic mountains, and deserts that reach around the entire planet. And one thing more. A giant sculpture that many scientists now speculate was created by some unknown race of intelligent beings. And if it is what it appears to be, what does that have to do with Earth? Mars is our nearest and most reachable galactic neighbor, but for some as yet unexplained reason, trying to study this planet has met with failure after failure. Beginning with two attempts by the Soviets in 1960, both missions mysteriously failed. After the problems the Russians had getting their probes to Mars, American scientists started to joke among themselves about some great galactic ghoul that was uh, preventing our missions from getting there too. In November 1964, the Americans launched the Mariner missions to Mars. But as, as it approached Mars, Mariner 3's camera shroud failed to open, making the camera useless. It does indeed seem that missions to Mars have met with an unusually high failure rate. But in July of 1965, the American probe Mariner 4 finally brought success and completed the first flyby of Mars. So had Earth scientists at last outwitted the galactic ghoul? Apparently not. When the Soviets then attempted to actually land a probe on Mars, something astonishing happened. Everything on the Mars probe seemed to be working perfectly, and then it just shut off. Could it be that there is something out there that's interfering with Earth's efforts to conquer space? Or is it all just an incredible string of coincidences? Whatever the reason, it was five years before the United States made another attempt to reach Mars. But in 1976, the Viking probe began sending volumes of images back to Earth from their orbits above Mars, including these. Encouraged by the success of the Viking probe, the Soviet Union, with international cooperation, uh, launched a, a set of satellites in 1988. Phobos-1 never even made it to the planet. At some point, it just disappeared. Uh, Phobos-2, the uh, probe that was sent up to look at one of the moons of Mars, apparently encountered something very strange, of which the Soviets had a picture that did surface in the United States. Of a very massive elliptical shape uh, object. Uh, the NASA individuals here that may know about it, of course, would never make a comment on it. And then it too disappeared. 
Has this bizarre string of space disasters occurred because we caught a glimpse of something we were not supposed to see? Has the Viking space probe presented us with a mystery that is unsolvable? The mystery first began to unfold in 1976, when the unmanned Viking space probe was going about its highly successful mapping mission of our neighbor planet. When the images that were transmitted back to Earth began to be analyzed, this surface feature in a region designated as Sidonia caught the attention of people all over the Earth. The initial official re reaction from NASA about this photograph is that it was just a trick of chance sunlighting. Certainly no one believed that there was a, a huge carved face on the surface of Mars. Besides, who could have made such a thing? Uh, no one believes in the science fiction version of men on Mars. And we know that Mars is not capable of supporting intelligent life as we know it. So the idea of this being a creation of intelligence was uh, not even considered by NASA. Despite all of this, when the image was first recorded, it was labeled head. Then we went through the archives to see if there was any other satellite passes over that same area. Uh, NASA said there wasn't at first, and uh, we looked through their archives and found one. And there, just as before, there was a face with a higher sun angle showing more detail than before. And images of the eyes showed pupils, and of the mouth area showed teeth. We were very impressed. These two separate frames, identified by their NASA frame numbers, 35A72 and 70A13, also contain considerable detail about the surrounding area, revealing several other images that DiPietro and Molinar found as exciting as the mysterious face. About 10 miles away from the uh, face is a couple of pyramids. Uh, and the strange thing about those pyramids is uh, they're very regular triangular shape. And in the corner of each corner there appears to be a buttress and uh, on close examination the, the buttress itself is pyramid shape. Was this undeniable proof that an intelligent race had once lived on the planet Mars? This would be really, really remarkable for this to be a natural formation. Many intriguing questions are raised by the apparent connections between this image from the planet Mars and ancient structures here on Earth. Perhaps the most intriguing being, does this image on the surface of another planet give us important clues to the origins of ancient structures on our world? Richard Hoagland's study team may have uncovered proof that one of our oldest relics was not built by human hands. And as I began looking at some references and books and talking with colleagues, this was a sketch done by Shannon, one of our early artists on the team, we, we both realized that this image was somehow trying to tell us something profound. It was trying to say this. Could the resemblance between the face at Sidonia and the Sphinx at Giza be more than a mere coincidence? Did the Egyptians, in fact, as we know them, do this remarkable structure. Recent archaeological and geological discoveries demonstrate that the Sphinx is at least 10,000 years old and maybe even older. That is, the Sphinx appears to be much, much more heavily weathered than we have any right to expect from only, quote, 5,000 years of desert weathering. The kind of weathering we see on the Sphinx is best explained by the action of running water. You need rain to get that degree of erosion, 12 feet of it in some places. And that amount of rain has not fallen in Egypt for at least 10, maybe 15 or 20,000 years. Now that raises a wonderful problem. It means that we're now looking at a monumental work of art created at a time when nobody else on planet Earth is supposedly to able to do anything of that magnitude or scale. There's no other contemporary civilization to pin it on. So who did it? Could these both be ancient sculptures made by the same race of beings? If so, who or what is this face intended to represent? The key to understanding the face on Mars may lie in the fact that the Sphinx of Egypt is a combination of hominid and feline, half man, half lion. This should be interesting. 
Hoagland's researchers, in comparing the two images, made an amazing discovery. Half lion. Maybe there's a connection. Maybe the face of Sidonia is half man, half something else. First, they copied the left half of the Sidonia head, made a mirror image of it, and pasted it onto the other side. The results were interesting, but inconclusive. However, when they tried the same thing with the right half, flipped it over and matched it up on the left side, the result was a clear image of a lion's head. Are these merely strange optical illusions, or are they the key to understanding the real truth behind our own past? Surely it's still possible that mere coincidence could be the culprit behind all of these so-called connections between monuments of Earth and the images we've seen from Mars. Or is there any more and better evidence? In southwest England, the ancient man-made mountain of Silbury Hill has loomed over the horizon since time immemorial. Nearby is Avebury, believed to be a fortress centuries old, tall, earthen walls protecting an inner mound. The area also contains an amazing connection to the structures at Sidonia. The connection here was determined not by simple observation and supposition, but was founded in the solid facts of geometry. The question was, what if the ancient ruins in England corresponded in size, shape, and dimension to the features on the plain of Sidonia? What if the Avebury Circle was to represent the crater and Silbury was to represent the Tholus, and the angles and positions of ancient features, including where the cliff would be, and where the tetrahedral pyramid would be, and angles to other key things in this vicinity, all seem to match. Including the very size of Silbury Hill in terms of its exterior uh, moat in reference to the Tholus. Were all of these structures built by the same race of beings? human or otherwise? And if so, does this constitute new evidence that intelligent life could have once thrived on the planet Mars? Richard Hoagland suggests many possibilities. Uh, one is that we had a previous high-tech civilization on Earth which developed spaceflight, went to Mars, built some stuff, and then collapsed. And we're now just rediscovering our heritage. The second hypothesis is that someone else from far out there, from the stars, thousands, hundreds of light years away, came to the solar system, came to Mars, built the stuff, and built a monument to this primitive being that would someday become a human being, the human species, here on Earth. In either case, it would seem that some global catastrophe forced the Martian population to abandon their world and move to another, to the Earth. And someday, we may discover, in fact, that we are the Martians after all. Assuming for a moment that there once was a flourishing race on Mars and that they built this complex structure, one important question remains. Why? Sidonia was probably constructed to communicate some very fundamental information. We believe now that we are looking at the outlines of a whole new physics, how the universe functions, a kind of a grand unified theory, as it were, given to us, communicated, even on the photographs taken by Viking, by the geometric layout of the structures. Researchers now believe that the key to understanding the geometry of the DNM pyramid may be in the size, shape, and position of the massive structure. Hoagland and others point out that the pyramid is not oriented to the Martian North Pole, but is turned slightly to one side. Latitude lines show that two of the faces are out of alignment at exactly the same angle, 19.5 degrees. Why 19.5? That on every major and minor planet that we have flown by, looked at, or mapped in the last 30 years through NASA imagery, the major disturbance, starting with Jupiter and the Great Red Spot, lies just about at 19.5 north or the Great Red Spot on the planet Jupiter is essentially a giant cyclone, an atmospheric storm larger than the entire planet Earth. It continues to churn away for year after year, right at 19.5 degrees south. 
Hoagland asserts that on every planet in our solar system, there does seem to be some kind of major geological or atmospheric disturbance found at 19.5 degrees north or south, including our own gigantic volcano, Mauna Loa. Colossal power rages up from the center of the Earth, emerging in the Hawaiian Islands at 19.5 degrees north. Does this suggest that the builders of the DNM pyramid recorded in its structure a sort of key to the inner nature of every planet in our system, including our own? According to Hoagland, the builders of the monuments at Sidonia had a reason for leaving the number 19.5 encrypted in a pyramid. This is a four-sided, four-cornered object termed a tetrahedron. Because if you put this structure in a sphere, it predicts some remarkable phenomena. Hoagland says that if a perfect tetrahedron or pyramid is placed inside a sphere, such as a planet, so that one tip is at the north or south pole, the other tips will fall at the latitude of 19.5 degrees north or south, the same as the angles discovered in the DNM pyramid. Was this giant tetrahedron built on the plains of Sidonia to help future generations understand the sources of power within their own planets? There are still so many questions left unanswered. Is this face just a natural formation? Or was it constructed by some long lost civilization? And what of the pyramids of Mars? Are they ancestors of the pyramids of Egypt? Or just uniquely shaped piles of frozen Martian soil? Is the perfect geometric precision found in these surface features of Sidonia nothing more than a bizarre series of coincidences? Could it be that we are descendants of ancient Martians who sought refuge from their own dying world? If so, does that mean that we are the Martians we claimed we might someday meet? As scientists plan future manned missions to the Red Planet, are we on the verge of learning that Mars is not only our destination, but was also once the beginning? Is this a portrait of the being who long ago made the very first entry into the UFO diaries? On 60 Minutes, the... In the late 1980s, something truly amazing began to happen in the green fields of England. Reports came in of sightings such as this. Silvery disks flying or hovering low over the open countryside. And apparently, these objects were seen in great numbers. The town of Warminster has gained the reputation as the UFO capital of England. The sheer number of sightings in that area has been nothing short of staggering. Uh, one particular phenomenon we've been watching with interest has been the sightings of a spherical object that seems to glow amber, orange or gold. There have been quite a number of sightings of that kind. And such UFO sightings were often only the beginning of the mystery. According to eyewitness accounts, with the first rays of the next morning sun, came astonishing evidence of the previous night's encounter with the unknown. Someone, or something, left an area of the field flattened, pressed down into perfect geometric shapes. The crops are not cut. They are not broken. Uh, they've been carefully and systematically swirled flat to the ground. And over the years, these patterns have revealed themselves to be perfect circles, or ovals, or circles with rings, and sometimes circles, rings, and satellites. If there is a connection between the UFOs and the mysterious markings, the so-called crop circles may constitute the most positive evidence yet for the existence of alien visitors to our planet. But are we sure that the crop circles and UFOs are related? Remember in the fall of 1991 when these two gentlemen in southern England were trotted out on the world media as the explanation for the crop circle mystery? Two guys who claim they did it all. According to them, they had boards which they pushed down across the grain and they just kept walking around in circles or whatever until they'd made the shapes they wanted. All of a big practical joke. And for some reason, the worldwide network media accepted that and announced to the world that the crop circle mystery had been solved. There simply is no way that just a two men uh, could have possibly constructed all of these patterns appearing on occasions 15 per day without getting caught at it. 
Uh, plus, if hoaxers went out during the middle of the night just to make this, how on earth would they have possibly constructed a pattern like Barbary Castle during the shortest night of the British summer? It would have taken a team of hoaxers days, and it appeared simply overnight. Uh, with crop circles like UFOs are a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, the U.S. and Canada, Australia, Japan, they're all over the place. I heard some of reports about them in the Soviet Union as well, in the former Soviet Union. They're a worldwide phenomenon, and the idea that two old English barflies are flying all over the world creating these things is, is patently ridiculous. Furthermore, many crop circle experts say the markings in the fields are perfect geometric figures, often accurate to within less than a quarter of an inch. And yet is it not possible that all the crop markings really are hoaxes? Even if Doug Bauer and Dave Chorley didn't make all the crop circles, might not the real culprits be hundreds of hoaxers all over the world? People that believe crop circles were made by human beings are overlooking some very important features of the crop circles. Uh, they are interwoven uh, and intricately laid, uh, not at all the way that they would be crushed to the ground if people stamped them. Current evidence seems to suggest that crop markings are created by some kind of aerial phenomenon, possibly a flying craft of extraterrestrial origin. But do we know that for certain? Much of what we've learned about the formation of crop circles has been based on eyewitness testimony. Uh, a young woman told us about a globe-shaped uh, UFO from which came a beam of light she described as being brighter than white. A beam of light which struck down across the dark sky into a field near the ancient uh, mound of Silbury Hill. In that field was discovered the next morning a Celtic cross pattern of crop circles. Usually that's considered to be extremely good evidence, but in the case of crop markings, the most striking proof may come from what is not seen. Several people claim to have witnessed the formation of crop circles and state they did not see any silver disks or globes or tubes floating in the sky above them. In fact, all they saw was absolutely nothing that was causing this effect. There was no whirlwind or anything like that. And so it truly seemed that the stalks of grain were simply falling over of their own accord. We, uh, we have more than 70 reports worldwide of people who claim to have seen things, things form. People describe frequently a buzzing sound they will see the plants oscillating, whiplashing, and suddenly uh, the effect takes place. And in less than 15 seconds, like opening up the fan, the plants are swirled and are lying to the ground. Uh, many people uh, describe seeing glowing lights, beams of light uh, entering the area. Uh, some describe as the golden ball of light enters the area, a loud explosion, a, a loud retort, a bang, at the same time as this particular uh, effect takes place. The Centre for Crop Circle Studies uh, kept a close watch on the English countryside throughout the summer of 1991. On June the 22nd, 1991, three of the observers spotted a, a glowing orange or golden ball hovering in the sky, then moving away at a fantastic speed. Unfortunately, uh, there were no crop markings that appeared on that night, but other markings had appeared on other occasions within just one kilometer of that location. Then, Colin Andrews and his surveillance team were more fortunate. Uh, we set up a sophisticated surveillance operation in 1991 uh, in which we deployed radar, uh, low-light cameras, infrared, and we even stationed some dogs uh, from a nearby farm in the field there. We secured the whole field with uh, security, uh, intruder, infrared beams, and we're convinced that no human being certainly could enter that area without us knowing about it. But at the early that morning, uh, we had a fog formed, and without any effect on any of the equipment, no radar returns whatsoever, from the center of that fog as it melted away was indeed this intricate pattern. Is that the purpose of the crop markings? For everyone to see them? Are they a message to humankind from some other form of life? As the years have gone by, the, the crop markings have been changing. They've been becoming increasingly complex and increasingly pictographic. In fact, many people now refer to all crop markings as agroglyphs, which simply means crop writings. If the agroglyphs are messages from some other life form, what do these messages say? And is there any way to decipher the code of the crop circles? 
Many people believe that the meaning of the markings is related to the place where they are found. Uh, for example, in England, the vast majority of the markings have appeared in the area around Stonehenge, uh, and also Selbury Hill, which is the oldest and the largest man-made mound in all of Europe. In fact, one of the most remarkable agroglyphs ever found appeared with its axis pointing directly towards Selbury Hill. Since we know that, that Stonehenge and Selbury Hill were the works of an ancient culture with a surprising knowledge of astronomy, we may wonder if whoever is making these symbols in the crops in this area didn't give them this knowledge thousands of years ago. Could UFOs have been common visitors to southwest England throughout its history? If so, it might explain at least one curious coincidence. In the region of the June 1991 sightings of the golden balls in the sky, there are numerous hills that still carry the names they were given hundreds of years ago. Is it significant that one of those was long ago named Golden Ball Hill? It is possible that someone has been trying to contact us for a long, long time, but that we haven't understood how to receive this message. I believe the crop markings are indeed messages, but not perhaps letters or words as we might think of them. I believe they are messages to the subconscious mind, a reminder of some deeply hidden part of ourselves that knows we are just one of many intelligent races in the universe. These extraterrestrials have been manipulating life on this planet for eons. If these are being formed by extraterrestrials, I guess we should at least be comforted uh, in the fact that they have attempted a communication. If these are communiques, what is the message? Are the governments of the world telling us all we need to know? Are we only now deciphering what may be a centuries-old warning? As the crop circles increase in complexity, at some point, perhaps the creators will make themselves known. the most remarkable stories in the UFO diaries began on the night before Halloween, 1938. The famous actor and director Orson Welles led his Mercury Theater of the Air in a radio drama in the form of a news broadcast, telling their listening audience that invaders from Mars were rapidly conquering the entire Earth. In spite of announcements telling everyone the show was dramatized, thousands believed it was a real event, and panic broke out across the country. Orson Welles and the members of the Mercury Theater seem to have proven that a story about invaders from another planet could be readily believed by thousands, even when there's not one scrap of truth behind it. For all practical purposes, they had invented the UFO hoax. But according to many UFO researchers, that hoax would by no means be the last. Yeah, right. In the last 50 years, there have been hundreds of people who have come forward with uh, various UFO claims. But it, la it later turned out, upon investigation, that these people were in fact hoaxers. The hoaxes themselves can range from uh, simply taking a, uh, a UFO picture to writing books claiming uh, that the individual had uh, flown to Venus on a UFO. In some cases, uh, the individuals will present evidence uh, which supposedly backs up their story, but again, upon investigation, the evidence um, proved not to be valid. Because of hoaxers, UFO researchers have been forced to provide more evidence for their claims. So for all of us seeking the real truth behind the UFO phenomena, hoaxes and frauds are a continual nuisance, especially when they are accepted by a large number of people as being the real truth. But how can hoaxes be detected? What methods do UFO researchers use to determine the credibility of a UFO report? It's generally helpful to consider the motivations of a person um, presenting a UFO report. Historian well, Curtis Peebles tells how the truth behind one UFO report was discovered. Um, in 1950, a man named Frank Scully wrote a book titled Behind the Flying Saucers. In it, he claimed that the U.S. government had recovered a crashed flying saucer near Aztec, New Mexico. Scully said he had been told 
um, the story of the crash by a millionaire oil man named Silas Newton. Now look, I'm giving you the story of the century, and if you know what's good for you, you're going to take it and run with it. That may be true, but I'm not going to write no story based on the evidence you told me. I have a reputation at stake. Now look, uh, what if I were to give you some incontrovertible, verifiable proof that what I'm telling you is true? What kind of undeniable proof can you show me? <laughs> and now you take a look at these. Uh, Newton described this disc as having remarkable qualities that no oh, earthly material could match. Scientists in the country test it. He says it's bona fide. If he says it is, you know it is. All right, Silas, I'll test these. And if they're true, I'll write your story. That's all I want. In fact, it was ordinary aluminum, the same as used in pots and pans. It had taken one very resourceful newspaper man named J.P. Kahn to uncover the truth behind the story. Um, they used the crash saucer story to defraud investors in their various oil exploration schemes. And they would tell them we got out of space, man. And we sell them uh, shares at $50 per. And uh, we say, hell, these guys are going back and forth between worlds. They sure as hell can dig a well. Subsequently right. led to their arrest and conviction on fraud charges. The Aztec incident and J.P. Kahn's exposure of the hoax illustrate how much confusion a hoax can cause in the field of UFO research. But what kind of evidence can be believed? After all, with many UFO sightings, there seems to be no real proof at all. Only one person's story of what they claim they saw. Is it in fact impossible to obtain real proof of visitors from outer space? even now that humankind has begun its own exploration of space. It would seem difficult to stage a false UFO sighting here. So would an astronaut's report of unidentified flying objects be considered undeniable evidence? During the early days of manned spaceflight, UFO sightings by astronauts seem to have been fairly common. But now UFO researchers are divided on how many of these accounts can be considered reliable. In some cases, the astronaut sightings were caused by simple mistakes by the astronauts themselves. One good example is the sighting which occurred on Gemini 4 by Jim McDivitt. Uh, he describes seeing a, a large cylindrical object with an arm sticking out of its side passing relatively close to the spacecraft. It wasn't until many years later that the object was identified as being Gemini 4's own booster rocket, which was in a similar orbit. It was uh, a simple mistake, but it wasn't an a alien spaceship. If intelligent beings from another world are visiting us here on Earth, it seems reasonable to believe they are far superior to us in intelligence and technology. With this logic, one might suspect that they would be able to study us, even interact with us, without ever leaving positive evidence of their presence here. Does this mean then that we'll never be able to prove or disprove the existence of extraterrestrial beings on Earth? It is a, it's a question of evidence. Are the abduction accounts alone sufficient to pr prove the event is occurring, or is something more tangible needed? Something like, say, uh, the landing on the White House lawn. I don't understand the motivation for, for making general statements like, if these things exist, where's the, where's the physical evidence? All elements of physical evidence that you could possibly want exist. We have pieces of material that allegedly came from a flying saucer in private hands. We have landing trace cases where the UFOs, the flying saucers, interact with the environment and there are things that can be studied there. We have photographic cases where the computer enhancement techniques and whatnot have not been able to tell us a mechanism for hoaxing the photos. We have not found the strings holding the object up, for example. There are videotapes, there are movie footage. There are good eyewitness accounts from credible individuals. There are multiple witness cases. Every criticism offered by the debunkers, and I separate the debunkers from the skeptics, but every explanation offered by the debunkers as a reason for not believing in the UFO phenomenon is not a credible reason. Because people have been seeing UFOs on every continent in every culture dating back hundreds or thousands of years all over the world. Millions and millions of people, and these are eyewitnesses. If it was in a court of law, their testimony would be enough to send you away to jail. But because it's UFOs, it's weird, well, that can't be true. 
true. I think uh, probably 90% of all UFO sightings are misidentifications of, of uh, explainable phenomenon, but it's also true that 9 out of 10 UFO sightings aren't reported at all. We really have no idea how many people over the years have seen these things, but the numbers are staggering, and, uh, and the, the reports are consistent. Uh, the question of whether humans are alone in the universe has been debated for centuries. Um, the answer may come sooner than we expect and in ways uh, we cannot anticipate. But until then, the world still waits for absolute proof of the truth or falsehood of UFOs. And we will continue to watch the skies and carefully record every bit of evidence in the UFO Diaries.